In today's video, we are going to have a look at a game played by Magnus Carlsen in Title Tuesday on chess.com. He's playing with the black pieces against a strong grandmaster from Chile with the name Henriquez. And the game is really special because Magnus is violating the general opening rules that you need to try to play for the center, develop your pieces first before starting an attack. Well, he has his own ideas, he has his own theories, and these theories are even more advanced. So I think we can definitely learn a lot from it. Well, let's see what happens in this game. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and I will show you this fascinating game. Well, Henrique starts here with the move G3. So this is, of course, a normal move. You would like to develop your king's bishop to G2, but it doesn't occupy the center with a pawn. So here, black sees the opportunity to strike immediately with a move h5. That's really bizarre. You would expect black to play a move like d5 or probably even e5. These are the standard moves to occupy the center if your opponent doesn't do it. But Magnus, he goes for the move h5. He wants to launch its h-pawn with the idea to activate a rook on the, uh, on the h-file. How should white counter it? Well, if you just play bishop g2, then black continues with the pawn coming to h4. So White decides here to play the move knight f3. And now the shocking thing on move 2 is happening. Because with this move knight f3, you think that White is controlling the h4 square and the h-pawn has been stopped. But Magnus played here the move h4. So here, this pawn can be captured in two different ways. Well, if you do take with the g-pawn, then well, you end up with an ugly pawn and there are ideas to play e6, bishop e7, and eventually this pawn will be lost. So that's not an attractive option for white. And therefore, Henrique has decided to take with the knight instead. Now, this is also a very typical scenario, which you can often see in other situations, other openings with the fianchetto the bishop, or at least where one side is trying to develop its uh, bishop to the long diagonal. You can sacrifice the exchange here with a move like rook takes h4. Very spectacular idea. But the compensation is not very clear and, well, it leads to interesting play, but there's no need to do it. And Magnus has a completely different idea. He says, okay, I've given up that pawn, but now I'm trying to control the center. I'm playing here the move e5. And this is interesting because now you're trying to play a normal game with very nice development, like you can place both pawns in the center, you can get your knights out, your, your bishops out. And Magnus is saying, well, I have a nice open file for my rook and I will use it later anyway. I don't care about that pawn. Let's see how it works out in, uh, in this game. Well, first of all, you cannot just go back with a knight to f3. It's possible, but then you run into the move e4 and you've got to make another ugly move with your knight. You don't really want to go back to... Um, to g1, but if you go to d4, then there are ideas to play c5 or maybe bishop c5. You're getting quite a number of easy moves to make here as, uh, as black. So instead of dropping back with the knight to f3, white played here the move d4. It's challenging the pawn on e5 so that after e takes d4, the knight can come back to f3 whenever it wants without being disturbed by black's e pawn. Okay, the pawn on d4 can be captured. Let's say if you take with the queen, well, that does allow also black to develop with gain of time. The knight will come to c6 and, well, it, it's offering black some reasonable play for the pawn. So instead of recapturing with the queen, white plays here the move knight f3. So intending to win the pawn back by capturing with the knight. But you see that white is investing quite a number of moves with the same piece. And that also affects the development of the other pieces. How should black play here well magnus has a choice now he can of course say i want to stick to this pawn now material is even but this is an ugly move because white is going to react with the move c3 challenging the pawn and if you take it well there's knight takes c3 with nice control over the center that's not what you want to play as black so magnus says okay you will win your pawn back and after d5 knight takes d4 white is a pawn up once again but here, black seizes the initiative by playing the move c5, attacking the knight, the knight goes back to f3, the knight goes to c6, bishop g2, knight f6. Now the game continues like what you would have expected from the very start, without this pawn on h7. Bishop g5, bishop e7, castling kingside, 
and now bishop e6. So here, interestingly, and of course that's the justification of black's play, black is not interested in castling kingside. He needs to keep that file open for the rook, but how to use that exactly? Well, that's what we are getting to see in the game. White, of course, also needs to think about how to continue developing. You may consider a move like knight bd2. But then there is queen d7, and now black's plan becomes very clear. He wants to go bishop h3, swap the bishops, then get a queen to h3, and together with the rook, you're hitting the pawn on h2. Well, of course, the pawn is still defended by the knight on f3, but the only other thing you have to do is try to eliminate that knight on f3. This is looking very dangerous, so therefore, white didn't play the move knight bd2. He played instead the move knight c3, but that has another drawback as black is now expanding in the center with the move d4. It's hitting the knight on c3. What should the knight do? Well, maybe you can go back to b1. Doesn't look very nice. A much more logical and consistent follow-up is to take with the bishop on f6, eliminating annoying knight and creating a square for the knight on e4. But how is black going to recapture? Well, if you do take back with the bishop, then after knight e4, you're even threatening to take the bishop again. Even the pawn on c5 can be taken as well. So rather than taking with the bishop, the key move here is to take back with the g pawn. Ugly pawns, isolated double pawns on the f file. But now black is announcing that he is going to play for checkmate. With the move knight e4, the knight comes under pressure. After f5, the knight got to move again. Knight back to d2. And now another fantastic idea by Magnus. He is using its double pawns very efficiently as he played here the move f4. Beautiful idea. So the point is that if you take the pawn, it's another pawn sacrifice, then queen c7 will be played. Hitting the pawn on f4, if you protect it with a move e3, then black is ready to castle queenside. The king is safe. And really, when you look at this position, it doesn't feel as if you're two pawns uh, down. In fact, black is having tremendous piece play, open files towards the king, position just plays itself. So instead of taking the pawn, white, try to look for some counterplay with a move like uh, c3, challenging that annoying pawn on d4. But after f takes g3, the white king will become uh, more exposed. How should you recapture? Well, if you do take back with the h-pawn, then again, it's queen d7. And if you now take on d4, it's bishop h3. Now even the h-pawn is missing, so the threats are really strong. If a queen can land on h3, it's just going to be checkmate, probably on, uh, on h1. And white will have to make some very ugly moves to avoid uh, mate here. So, therefore, Henriquez played here the move f takes g3. Now, Magnus went for the move queen b6. Of course, he's looking at his pawn on b2, but much more importantly here is the fact that the dark square diagonal towards the white king is wide open. White captured on d4. And of course, you can take back and take it from there, but Magnus playing so energetically, he's not interested in the material. He played here the move castling queenside. I really love this move. And frankly speaking, the position is not absolutely clear yet. There are still various ways to, uh, to play, including move like, like rook c1. According to the machine, things are not that clear. But instead, I want to show you some critical idea. For instance, if you would take on c5, bishop takes c5 with check, king h1, and now you have various ideas. The, the easiest one here is just to play bishop f2 with the idea to take on g3 and take it from there. But another beautiful idea is bishop b4, hitting the knight. If you get out of the pin on the d file with queen c2, you take on d2, knight takes d2, what else to do? Now it's rook takes h2. This also is a beautiful illustration of black's strategy here. You're sacrificing the rook on this open file. King takes rook, rook h8 check, and the king cannot go to g1 because of that queen on b6. After something like bishop h3, don't take with the rook actually, because then the king is safe on g2. But much better is to take with the bishop to set up a huge discover check against the white king. If the rook goes to f4 with the idea that after bishop f1 discover check, 
you can interfere with the rook on h4. Well, then it's queen f2 check, king h1, and queen g2 with checkmate. I thought this was absolutely worth showing you because this is so typical for positions in which you have opened up your file to activate uh, the rook. Of course, this was not, uh, not played in the game. Let's see what happened. King h1 was played, very understandable move to get out of this diagonal, but the king is not much safer here, and it's standing in the line of the rook. Here, Magnus played a call move, king b8, just to get out of the c-file. White played a move, queen to c1, but here, black decided to take with the knight on uh, d4. And this looks pretty nice. There are ideas to take on, um, on e4. Oh, on e2, sorry, and uh, well, there are also other ideas just to continue the attack with uh, doubling rooks on the uh, on the h file. Well, white played here the move knight c4, attacking the queen, but black is just moving the queen away. Queen c7 with the threat to take on g3. Now knight takes d4 was played, and don't get too greedy here by taking the pawn on g3 because that does allow the move queen f4 with check and white succeeds in trading off the um, the queens here. So don't do that, much stronger is just to take with the rook on d4. Now the knight on c4 is hanging, the knight got to move, it went back to d2, otherwise you lose the piece and now queen takes g3 is just killing, you are making use of this uh, open h file the h pawn cannot take knight f3 and here magnus play the move bishop d6 of course he is threatening to checkmate on h2 if you for instance play queen g5 intending to exchange queens well it's rook takes h2 knight takes h2 queen takes h2 with checkmate and well is there not a better way to defend here as uh, white well the, the only alternative is to try to run away with the king but then it's rook takes h2 Knight takes h2, what else? Queen takes, king f2, queen h4 check, nice idea. And the king is caught in a mating net. For instance, king to e3 runs into queen g3 check. The rook covers the d-file. And if you block on f3, it's bishop f4 with checkmate. The other option is to play king f3, but then it's queen g3 with checkmate. And going back to g1, well, that just runs into bishop h2 check. The king cannot come to f2 as the queen covers that square. King h1, bishop g3, king g1. And now it's queen h2. The bishop supports the queen as well it takes away the f2 square from the white king. Let me know in the comments what you think of this game. I thought it was a very impressive game. An unusual opening, but also one with some general ideas which you may apply in your own games like you're launching your H-pawn with the idea to deflect the white knight to, in order to gain control over the center. I thought this was very instructively played by Magnus. Thanks for watching and see you soon again. Bye-bye.